Hey guys, welcome to Fascinated with Fungi Live. Today we're going to be talking to Jakey Cho, who is a journalist, actor, uh, influencer, all sorts of stuff. He's a thought leader in the space on uh, food and culture and travel. He has directed or helped, I guess, helped co-produce a documentary right now that's uh, streaming on Netflix. Uh, it's called Bad Rap. He's been a writer for Complex and Double XL and Vice and a whole bunch of different magazines. He's interviewed famous rappers. Uh, he's traveled and he's sort of a man of the world. And he's just somebody that I've seen on TikTok that I'm a huge fan of and really loved his vibe. And he has a very uh, particular vernacular and voice that is, I think, kind of infectious and cool. And I just reached out to him because I was like really fascinated by what I could learn from him. And uh, we had a great chat earlier today where I'm super excited to kind of like run over some topics with him and just kind of like have a super interesting dynamic back and forth where we can learn from each other. So I hope that you guys enjoy it. Uh, I just saw Jakey join, so I'm going to get him on the call here. Uh, do, 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 do. Where are you? There we go. Cool. Jakey, I'm sending you the invite. So anyhow, I'm going to try to summarize everything that Jakey does, but like he can tell me better. Hey, man, how you doing? Yo. How's it going? Yo. It's good. To, it's good to see it. It's nice. It's like always fun to find your uh, your TikTok heroes in real life and like see people in real time. It's a uh, it's quite an experience. I'm not I'm not a hero, man. You're a hero. <laughs> You're a hero. So I was just trying to relate to people like the insane diversity of cool stuff that you've done um, because you've been you've been a writer for guys like Complex and Double XL. So you've interviewed like famous rappers. You have directed or I guess co-produced your own documentary. Uh, you do all this like cool stuff on social media. What? How do you describe yourself? What do you What do you um, say your mission is? Yeah, I mean, you know, right now my if I have to describe myself, I'll call myself a uh, a producer and a, and a writer. Uh, but I'm I'm also a small business owner. If I have to use those uh, categorical terms to sum up like what I do mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. yeah I mean that's how I would describe myself but I guess like depending on what the occasion you know I'll introduce myself with a different title like if I have to go see my girlfriend's parents I'll say I'm a business owner I'm not gonna yeah, tell yeah, smart them. smart I'm, not gonna tell them <laughs> I'm a TikTok personality you know <laughs> so um, yeah that's how I use you know like to navigate it I mean what about yourself do you do you introduce yourself as a uh, a fungi master or do you tell people that you you know you worked in the wine industry or that you were a phd you know it's yeah all, all the above i mean it's like you said it, it depends a little bit on the context you know there's certain places if i walk in and i drop the phd thing people are immediately going to just dismiss me exactly and, you know it helps to be a little bit more like salt of the earth and then there's other times when i really want to lay it down and be like yes i'm dr gordon walker you know it's you kind of you adjust the situation kind of thing, but uh, your your small business is that is it like a fashion brand or it's some sort of streetwear yeah, kind of yeah. thing you guys are doing? Yeah, it's it's a retail store. Um, I mean, it's a retail. It's a, it's an archaic, dying industry. But <laughs> um, fortunately, you know, we were able to stay in business, um, and we are continuously expanding and evolving. Um, mm -hmm you know, doing different various forms of verticals in the online space. Um, and also, I think when a, when an industry starts to um, minimize itself, you know, the strongest survives and the mm. strongest tends to be the toughest. And um, I'm wondering, like, if that's kind of the case with, uh, like, what's happening with mushrooms. Like, is, is, like, the best mushrooms that remains, you know, like, in the woods, are they like the best ones or are they the deadliest? Like, how does Ooh. that work? Okay, so that's, I mean, that's that's a deep question. There's a lot of nuance there. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, that's a big question in science right now is how does competition work? Because traditionally in biology, people have always thought of uh, competition being the main driver for the way that life goes, right? That if there's competition, one species will always beat out another species. And that's, that's derived from plants and animals and the way that we've always sort of taken biology and broken things apart and trying to look at them as separate entities. What they're realizing now, there was a lot of fungi. Fungi are kind of like crazy socialists. They don't <laughs> care as much about like competition between one another. 
because a lot of fungi are actually linked by this, what's called the mycelial network. So these little microscopic threads in the soil, and they're all linked to the plants and actually helping the plants to share nutrients, almost like a like social security net where everybody's paying what? in a little bit to get benefit and access to this broader network. And so it's, it's really interesting because there is a lot of questions about like how do fungi interact and is like one dominant over another. Um, to your point though, there is one invasive fungi that came over from Europe uh, called the death cap. <laughs> And that's, that's Amanita phylloides. That is like the one of the scariest mushrooms out there because that mushroom is overtaking. It's, it's out competing a lot of native species, especially on varieties of oak. And so all over like the Eastern and Western US, they're watching death caps spread all over the place. Oh, it's, it's, and we it's don't know what's like happening. Chris, so it's like Christopher Columbus bringing smallpox. Yeah, it's colonizer. Killing, yep. killing indigenous people. Yeah, it's that, it's that full on colonizer energy, man. It's, it's no good. And the death, and people are always calling me like, Gordon, is this mushroom going to kill my dog? Should I rip it out of the ground? I'm like, well, ripping a mushroom out of the ground doesn't get rid of the mycelium. So like that doesn't do much. Um, and normally I'm like, just leave the mushrooms be. They're fine. You know, like they're just signing a healthy soil. But the death cap is one that I'm like, I'm scared of that shit. That thing will kill you if you take a bite of it. So I mean, how, how do you differentiate it? Like, how, how does it look like? Is there a, a specific features that we should be aware of? So it's a it's an amanita, which is a particular kind of mushroom. You know the um actually you can see it on my, my poster behind me. You know the classic red and white mushroom with the little dots on top? Yeah, like the Super Mario joint. Bingo, yeah. So that's that's an amanita. So it has the same sort of basic architecture of having a stem and a cap. Right. Uh, the cap of the death cap tends to be smooth and doesn't have little dots on it and is kind of like a pale, sickly green. Honestly, mm -hmm. if you saw the mushroom, you'd be like, That thing that that looks bad. It's just bad news. It's a bad actor, you know? Uh, so there's a few okay. other like little things you can look at, but like that kind of pale green thing is the thing to look out for. And like, yeah, no way. From what you said is is fascinating how you kind of um, made a parallel between the mushroom space, the universe of the mushrooms, to you know pretty much left wing, right wing politics, to mm -hmm. capitalism, there. socialism. That's yep. fascinating, man. How you made that parallel, man. I'm gonna start saying that <laughs> that fun guy is actually a very socialist. Uh, approach you know they make very socialistic approach yeah. in terms of their endeavors it's it's because i think there's a human element of thinking that we can always do things better than nature right and that goes hand in hand with building things that are you know trying to just you know mow down nature and put up a parking lot kind of thing right you right, think right. we can do better because our parking lots and our malls are better than the forest but right. as you realize, you go on in life, you're like, wow, there's tremendous value in that nature, in that forest. And by putting a parking lot over it, we just destroyed everything. And there's, yeah, there's yeah. space for us to realize that we can work with nature, be part of it, instead of always like imposing ourselves upon it, you know? No, no, 100%. I mean, speaking of parking lots, um, <laughs> I was just thinking about like, you know, every time anybody mentions parking lots, um, I, I want to bring it to Las Vegas. So I used to go to Vegas like twice a year because um, a lot of trade shows happened there. Mm -hmm. You said that you worked in sales before. Yeah. Um, I, I know so trade I, shows. I like being yeah, out on the yeah. floor so sometimes. I'm you know, that fun. you were in Vegas for your particular industry? Not, well. not for, I, I'm mostly around California for the wine industry stuff. But got you, got you. I got to go back to Vegas as an adult. I've only been as a kid. So I've never got the fun part of Vegas. I just got, got the you. like, you're not allowed on the, on the gambling floor part of Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Like, so... <laughs> For me, like I used to go twice a year because of all the clothing trade show happens. Mm, there, like, gotcha, yeah. Um, and every time I go, um, I just kind of, it just really like made me angry that this city exists. Not because yeah. of the human makeup or like the, uh, you know, the social makeup of it. I'm fine with that, right? Everybody yeah. has to go somewhere to make a living. But this is a city that's not meant to exist. Like right. it's humanity is not, it's in a fucking desert, <laughs> you know? And you have yep. this massive parking lots and massive uh, spaces that are just basically built for these trade shows to take place once a year. Mm -hmm. And most of the time mm -hmm. these places are vacant and they're just waiting to be filled. Um, and you know, you see like, grass lawns and you see like golf courses i'm like yo it's just this is completely going against what's supposed to happen here you know what i mean yeah and, I, I feel you <laughs> yeah man and 
And it just kind of, I mean, again, like, I think the city has its own unique culture, uh, has like a pretty dope food scene. Um, you know, I, I enjoy it for what it is. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, shout out to everybody that works in the full gamut of the industry over there, whether it's a DJ to the strippers to, you know, people working at tables, all that. But I just thought that like, hey, this city isn't supposed to exist. Now, you know, so I wanted to kind of like add on to that, right? So do you feel like, you know, as somebody who looks into nature to find, you know, resources and inspiration, um, like what makes you like, like how do you feel about these things? Where when you see stuff like, like, hey, this isn't supposed to be here. Like, how does that make you feel? And um, like, it's, yeah, like yeah. I'm curious to it's, know, man. Because it's you a, work it's in a wine, tough question. You work yeah. In, like, yeah. You know, well, I mean, I, I look at wine too, and I'm like, a lot of the vineyard we keep ripping up forests to plant more vineyards, and you know, as really? yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not not so much here in Napa, but in lots of California, right. they keep mowing down what's called oak chaparral. It's habitat mm -hmm. that's kind of you know hills with oaks and stuff like that, and they keep mowing it down to plant more vineyards in, in random places. We already have more grapes and wine than we know what to do with. It's a little bit like what's happening with petroleum. It's like we have more petroleum and stockpiles than we could burn without you know causing the world to become a potato chip essentially uh and and so like we're we're still out there prospecting and harvesting more even though we already have so much that we can completely burn up the world with what we have and so it's it's this weird like i was saying it's that human projection onto nature um and like i don't have any you know vegas is great there needs to be a place for people to go and do that kind of thing but the fact that vegas runs off this like unsustainable aquifer water that's deep in the ground much like the oil that's deep in the ground will eventually run out and by bringing it all to the surface like we're not doing ourselves any favor by like not leaving those batteries those resources you know in the ground for us to access when we really need them instead we're just burning them up and you see those giant fountains in vegas you're like where do you think that water comes from yeah uh, I, mean, I mean you could argue that most of southern california is kind of the same way right and there's there's places around like the salish sea that were like huge resorts like 50 years ago and now are like complete ghost towns because there's no water and like we're gonna see some really bad shit happening in California this year because of the lack of rain. So. Oh man, I mean, do you think like Vegas is gonna be like Atlantis, the lost <laughs> city of like like the lost city of Vegas? You're gonna have ar archaeologists like digging up g-strings, be like, "What was this?" <laughs> um, yeah, man, maybe, maybe. Yeah. All right, all right. I wanna I wanna get into this because I got a lot of things I want to ask you about. Um, you and I talked earlier a little bit about your relationship with mushrooms. And I think like as an adult, you seem fascinated, but as a kid, you had an experience that kind of turned you off of mushrooms. And that's like, that's not uncommon. I hear this kind of thing all the time. Really? So you, you yeah, you were eating some like, you know, Korean glass noodles and you probably had like an enoki or some little mushroom in there and you ate that and then you like felt sick and, and that didn't agree with you. What, how did yeah, that like yeah. impact the way you looked at mushrooms as a food for the rest of your life? It definitely did, man. I mean, um, so so the mushroom that was in this particular dish, so the dish that I'm talking about is called chapche. It's a glass noodle dish that's very popular, um, especially amongst, like, non-regular Korean food consumers. Yeah. So, like, yeah. it's one of those dishes, like, as a Korean, I would never order at a restaurant. But, like, you go with, like, non-Korean friends, they're like, yo, let's order that. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, like... You know, not, you know, so it's one of those things, right? Yeah. So, and in this, in this dish, like, they always put um, shiitake mushrooms. Mm, oh, shiitake, okay. Yeah, so that's very, a very like, strong earthy. flavor, too. Yeah, very, yeah, very strong. Very earthy, very, like, wiggly almost. You know yep, what I mean? Yep. And, like, um, especially when they, like, marinate that with, like, sesame oil. You know, it's like, it's like slithering all mm -hmm. over with the glass mm -hmm. noodles. So as I'm like slurping this noodle, the shiitake kind of like went in and it kind of just, just hit me with the flavor and I was trying to swallow it, but it didn't sit well with me. I mean, I, I still don't, it still don't, doesn't really sit well with me. I mean, mind you, like I love like, you know, a jelly ear mushrooms. Mm -hmm. you know, I love the gnocchi mushrooms. I, I could eat all those, but shiitake, it just doesn't really sit well with me. And, you know, I kind of, it, it was trying to go into my pipes and then it ejected it. Well, I guess it rejected it. <laughs> you know, 
and uh, and a whole situation came out of it. Yep. You know, yeah, it that, happened as no a fun. kid, and um, ever since then, I just kind of had like a, a a negative perspective on um, mushrooms. You know, so like I tell I tell my friends like, yeah, I eat everything except like I'm not like dying to eat mushrooms. You know, but to be fair, like I said, I love enoki. You know what I mean? When you put that in a stew, I love it. Like I love um. What's the type of mushrooms that you put when you like make steak? Uh, just your standard like cremini kind of mushroom, yeah, yeah, like yeah, the ones yeah. you get at the grocery store. Yeah. Yup, yup. Like I love. I mean, I like it. I like those to some degree. You know, when you like, when you cook it with butter, everything tastes good. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So yeah, like so I, you know, for the record, for all mushroom lovers that are watching this, you know, I don't hate mushrooms it's not like i'm like rallying against mushrooms like um but you know if if there's one food that i try to avoid if there's like if it's in like a, a you know oh yeah, yeah. Pick, you pick like around dish, it in the stir fry I, I, kind of thing yeah, yeah. it's like i, I, I pick feel you. That out. like i never yeah. understand people that don't eat like onions or pickles when they order like a burger i'm like right Ooh, how old are you for you know what i mean <laughs> like i don't understand you but you know i kind of do do that with do like mushrooms mushroom. Yeah, yeah I, I hear you. So, so here's an interesting thing. I would say that shiitake and then the cremini, which is so portobello's, creminis, and white and button mushrooms are all the same mushroom. Mm -hmm. They're all called agaricus bisporus. That's the, the name of the mushroom. They're pretty similar to the kind of mushrooms you'd find like grown on your lawn in the middle of summer. Oh, wow. Um, but those are probably shiitake and agaricus bisporus are probably like two of the most heavily flavored, most strongly flavored mushrooms that exist, period, out of the entire spectrum of edible mushrooms out there <laughs> and i think it's interesting because like they're strong flavors so they they you can really build that flavor in a dish like a mushroom cream sauce or like you put shiitake in a ramen broth or something and it like there's a lot of flavor but for a lot of people that can be kind of overwhelming right and so that's one thing where like if i'm telling someone to try mushrooms the first time or someone like you who's like i don't know if i really like mushrooms it's like stay away from those try something like uh, i don't know if you've ever seen lion's mane but yeah, yeah, lion's yeah, mane, yeah. yeah, lion's mane has like, it has like the texture of like seafood or crab and has like very, very light flavor. So there's things like that you can always try. And like, you know, I've talked to multiple people who like had bad experience with the mushrooms as a kid. And like, trust me, if you eat with me, I will continually try to feed you mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, you like get people to try one thing and it's, it's, you know, like I, I you've had this experience cause, and I want to ask you about this, but you've been to Mexico city recently and there's like experiences that come along with travel where you try something that you thought you didn't like, and then suddenly you have it in a different context, in a different place, and it just shifts your perspective. And you're like, holy cow, here's this food that I like. I spent my whole life not liking red peppers. And then I went to Spain and had like paquillo peppers and was like, oh man, this is really good. This shifted what I thought. And I like, I'm pretty sure when you were in Mexico City, you had a wheat lacoche, right? The yeah, corn smut? Lacoche, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's corn a mushroom, farmers. right? Yeah, exactly. What'd you think exactly. of that? Yeah, no, I loved it, man. I mean, uh, we look culture, like, you know, especially when you do it with, like, just pure, like, no bullshit mm. cheese that, mm. like, the indigenous people of Mexico, like, has produced centuries ago in the same process. And you put that in a tortaleta, tortaleta I mean, say no more. It just tastes beautiful. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful combination. Right. I mean, um, and to that point, though, I do think, like, a lot of food that we eat in America, um, because they are designed to be living on a shelf for yeah. an X amount of time, and is usually produced with this uh, human hubris that, yo, like, we're really going to eat all these avocados. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, They're yeah. never really produced, like, seasonally, right? Mm -hmm. Like, when you go to, like, other parts of the world, Mind you, they have been taint, uh, uh, you know, tainted with American way of doing things. Um, a lot of food is still could be consumed in, in season, right? right. Like so right. when I was you, in Mexico, you pick it, you eat it, right? That's exactly like, you know, and if and uh, and a lot of the food knowledge is so ingrained in the social fabric that um, people know when it's like mango season, like people right. know when right. it's like orange season, so. When I was in Mexico recently, it was like mango season. So you go to a restaurant, like they serve you like mango oriented dishes. Like you're not like looking for mango in like December. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
demanding why isn't there fresh mango? You know? yeah, why don't I have my mango salsa with my Christmas ham? Exactly. Right? Like, you know, it's ridiculous. So I, I just think like to your point, right? Like you go to certain parts of the world and you realize like, okay, like there's actually better ways of consuming these things. And, you know, like tomatoes in Greece and Italy just tends to taste better. You know they I mean? pop like, they because like, they because they eat them they harvest them in season and if you don't eat them in season you preserve them as sauce which exactly. we do here too but even even in america like i live in california so i see the huge like trucks of tomatoes going by right, the right. majority of the tomatoes that they're picking for sauce are like barely ripe they're not even red necessarily right. and they bring them in they treat them with ethylene to turn them red it's a gas that makes fruit go ripe and then they'll process them in a sauce kind of thing because if they pick overripe tomato they pick ripe tomatoes they'll get squished and then they get fermented and then you get weird flavors in the sauce so there's like so much of our food culture is based around transportation and logistics not nutrition and flavor right and that that gets expressed in our food too because then on top of having food that's not even as nutritious when it comes in then we process it and take all the fiber out of it and add extra sugar and then like smack it on a shelf and say this will last four years in a package and you're like well that's great but like what about food that I actually want to eat, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And and I think that kind of also goes back into the conversation that we just had about Vegas as well. And then like yeah, the yeah, yeah. concept of design behind places like California. Like, I love LA. I love, like, the Bay. I love, you know, again, like, the, the social fabric of things, right? But, yeah. like, they're designed not for, like, humans to walk. They're designed mm, yes. for people to buy cars. Right. It's it's like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, if you look at all the ancient cities, there's a reason why they're designed the way they are designed is because so people could walk from point A to point B. But places in West Coast, they're all designed for people to drive from point A to point B. Yeah. And, that, so, and that's why we have such horrendous traffic all the time, constantly, because... Exactly. There was no no plan in place. In fact, there was a plan in place. We had railroads. We had systems that would have been public transportation, and then the oil companies bought up all the roads, all the the you know stuff, and destroyed them. So there was like a there's this crazy history of how like oil got rid of public transportation in the in California in the West. Exactly. But it was already established in places like Boston and New York. And exactly. I guess I want to ask you. So you're you're in Queens and that's like clearly a huge part of your identity, but like you've come from Korea to China to Queens, which has made you a very like, I think a worldly, you know, guy of the world, which I appreciate because that like that sentiment and that knowledge and that um, awareness comes through in the content that you make. But like, I've seen you doing a lot of stuff in Queens that's very hyper localized. Uh, but what you're doing too is helping to support and buoy up small businesses. Can you talk to me a little bit about your whole project with like, uh, saving small restaurants around Queens and around New York? Yeah, yeah, 1,000%. I mean, um, yeah, thank you for saying that, man. I mean, um, I, you know, Queens, I know I probably emphasize this or overemphasize this a lot, is um, is, is the borough in New York City, one of the five boroughs. And um, I, I could probably say that in terms of just like sheer real estate, in terms of the concentration of the population, it is like the most ethnically diverse concentration of people living in a piece of land in like the entire world, I would say, you know, just because uh, by in terms of like sheer number of diversity, right? Mm -hmm. And different cultures and people from different exactly. backgrounds. And from that, it's a place where a lot of immigrants land because it's historically one of the cheapest places in New York to live. And, and also, it's one of the like, places that like has resisted airports. gentrification. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's airports like and airports, access. So they probably just landed in JFK. It's like, hey, <laughs> we're here, like, might as well stay. Let's start from here. You know, right. it's, I call it the New Ellis Island. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. New Ellis Island. So I grew up there. And um, a lot of these, uh, uh, so the labor force that is behind a lot of the food and hospitality industry, um, they're people of color, specifically Central American folks, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a huge population of that in Queens, um, and as well as like Asian immigrants, you know, like um, obviously, you know, there's an image of the Asian immigrants that um, have upper mobility, that are, um, you know, upper middle class, right. you know, that, that definitely exists. But um, there's also 
a huge immigrant population that, you know, work in the service industry, whether it's like working in restaurants and also Asia, I think oftentimes people paint Asia, which is this continent of 5 billion people. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> one singular brush. Like there's East Asians that probably came here for school, but then there's like refugees from like Cambodia and Vietnam. Like their social experiences in America is going to be vastly different. It's like night and day. So, right. um, so yeah, a lot of these um, people that work in the service industry live in Queens. And um, when the pandemic erupted, um, a lot of these restaurants that provided jobs for these people um, that reside in Queens um, weren't working. You know, a lot of yeah. So the also, the fine dining restaurants that are staffed by these immigrants and these sort of underserved people suddenly everything the bottom dropped yeah. out and there was no nowhere to work. And, and the local restaurants that were providing services for these people were also getting impacted because these people aren't working, right? So. Right. You know, so it's, it's, the economy is like a, is, is a domino effect. So, you know, these restaurants that I grew up visiting, they really like built who I am as an individual, um, me into who, how I perceive the world and how I navigate the society. And yeah. I felt like uh, food media um, makes more money than the actual food industry, right? Like when you look at like magazines like Bon Appetit, Eater, and these places like uh, Smorgasburg, and you know these are like very successful media operations, and um, right. I just felt like you know they're, they're great publications and great media companies and great strongholds in the industry, but you know they weren't really empowering these local businesses. Uh, where I was coming from, so right. I just felt they, like they hey, they tend to feature really high end often white chefs right. rather than going out and finding your local eatery, which is like, I, I mean, one thing too, I want to like think about is like people always think about ethnic food is cheap, which I think is a real disservice to like the American experience that we assume that Indian and Mexican and, and, you know, Vietnamese food should always be cheap. And you're like, no, this stuff can be elevated, but at the same time, maybe it shouldn't be elevated and charged 20 bucks, 30 bucks a plate by a white guy making it just because there's right. a, you know, a, a little granny down the street who's doing the same thing better for less money. Right, um, right, right. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I get, you know, you're trying to go out there and help buoy up the people who deserve to be buoyed up by this. Yeah. Yeah. 1000%. So yeah, that was pretty much the whole spirit behind it. I mean, I was able to accumulate a little following on TikTok um, from, you know, making cooking videos yep. during the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, when I realized that, hey, like now that I have a little bit of a platform, um, I should try to utilize this platform to sh uh, sh spread awareness and um, share uh, whatever I have with the community that built me into who I am. So that was pretty much the whole purpose of it. The series is called Righteous Eats. It's ongoing because um, the, the impact of the pandemic, obviously it was the strongest hit at the moment, but this is something that is pretty much ongoing. Sorry, I'm in New York. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> you know? Yeah, this is something that is ongoing because, you know, like there's all this overdue rent for all these small businesses, right? Like um, landlords, maybe they were generous for a few months, but they have mortgage to pay. So again, like these restaurants, a lot of them are currently in debt. And I think um, they just need more support from the community um overall holistically not just me you but just everybody you know and it also gives up people an opportunity to go out of their comfort zones you know like, yeah. yeah so yeah that's i, I like I, I mean i was gonna say i always know i'm gonna get the best food if i walk into a place and i generally don't see anyone who looks like me and that was you know that's straight from tony bourdain it's like go somewhere where people don't look like you yeah go in and order the thing that you don't really know what it means but you know it's gonna be good and it's okay to walk into a place and be like I want what he's having, you know, you're like, use right. your eyes, use your senses. Don't be afraid of trying new things. And, and, you know, generally because the cost of those restaurants are fairly low, you can probably order more than what you need, take some home. And if there's something you really don't like, you know, give it to one of the homeless guys on the street. There's yeah, a lot of yeah. things that you can do to support these small businesses. So, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure to watch your righteous Eats series. That's, that's one of my favorites. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. I think, um, and that applies to like, you know, people of color as well. Like, you know, like, cause, like, let's say if I go to, like, some famous Italian restaurant in Manhattan, 
obviously is probably going to be great, yeah. but sometimes I might just want to go somewhere where I feel like uncomfortable. Like mm. I, I might go somewhere like in um, South of Brooklyn where I see like guys that look like they come straight out of the Sopranos, you know what I mean? <laughs> Giving yeah. each other kisses on the cheek as they greet each other and um, make me feel wild uncomfortable, you know, just being there. And um, I'll get what they're having. <laughs> and, yeah, but you know, you know you're going to have like the best Italian sandwich of your exactly. life when you go to that place because they're exactly. cutting everything fresh, you know? Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that experience could be uh, as translatable to everybody. Yeah, it's, it's, a, I mean, it's a great sort of cultural thing is that, you know, New York, that, like that is the American experience in some ways is we've all been pushed together uncomfortably close from a lot of different backgrounds. And yeah, there's some friction. There is some of that like boiling over. And we've certainly seen that on like a wider degree in society. Uh, but you know, I, I like looking at food culture because I feel like that's one of the places that like, if you can eat another culture's food, you can start to understand where they come from and the values they hold and the reasons they think in certain ways because food is, food is a uniter, right? We as human beings key into delicious things and you walk across cultures, you go around the world and you're like, wow, I can find a version of dumplings ever. I can find a version of sandwiches or flatbreads or something in every single culture. And you start to realize that we all have more things in common, which again, in a very hippie way, circles back to nature and mushrooms and all that stuff to be like, there is all connection between things. And it's like interesting to see how human society mimics what happens in nature and how these structures build and layer and are nuanced in, in fascinating ways. So No, um, exactly. Man. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, the more food you eat, you know, the the more you understand, like you said, that we have more in common than difference. Yeah. Like, like, like you just mentioned, um, I was in Mexico and then I just recently visited, uh, I visited this uh, place called Oaxaca, the state yeah. of Oaxaca. And I was Oaxaca. in Oaxaca City, which I think it was, uh, is one of the oldest uh, American um, cities pre, you know, colonial period. And um, a lot of the food that they eat um, stems from what the nature in that area provides, which is like corn, um, you know, a lot of beans, mm -hmm, a chapulín, mm -hmm. which is like grasshoppers. You know what I'm saying? That's that's protein. <laughs> that, yeah, that's, as a source of protein, right? Yep. And, and it was beautiful that um, there's like this very diverse and complex food culture that existed here for thousands and maybe tens of thousands of years that you know provided a, a healthy, balanced diet for these people here. And, um, you know, they didn't need anything. They didn't need like pork, they didn't need meat, and they were right. totally fine with it. You know what I'm saying? And, um, but like the, 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 the tech, the techniques that go into preparing and presenting this food, tortilla, which is carbs in a flat bread, which is very similar to a pizza. And there is a dish that they called a, a la yuda which is essentially a flat giant tortilla oh, size yeah. of like a spirit bomb in Dragon Ball reference. And then they paste it with beans, which is essentially their tomato sauce. And they yep. put toppings on it. They put like protein on it. And that's how they eat it. And I was like, yo, this is like very similar to a pizza. Yeah, gigantic you know folded pizza that's yeah. crispy and, and you know like, has all the umami. Like, yeah. Exactly. And this, this existed like way before like Spaniards came to Latin America. And they weren't having any sort of interactions with Italians, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> how did this dish come about? Um, because of nature, because of what nature provided for us. Right, and right. Humans are designed to think, you know, in similar patterns, you know what I'm yep. saying? So I think there's a universal connection with that. For sure. There's a, there's a thing in, in evolutionary biology, and you see it a lot in mushrooms. It's called convergent evolution. Mm. And this is the idea that, like, traits have been evolved multiple times. You see it with like, there's multiple lineages of flying squirrels that have all evolved the wings, even though they aren't related. And you see it in wow. mushrooms. There's mushrooms <laughs> that look similar to each other because they've adopted the same kind of like, whether it's a puff ball or a stink horn or some of these weird looking things. There's lots of things that have come from different directions to form into the same shape because it's the same kind of, there's certain ways of eating food and there's certain ways of producing spores and being a mushroom that just work really well. And so mm -hmm. nature and evolution over time has selected again and again. And it's no surprise that stuff like dumplings and flatbreads and, you know, pizza exists right. because it's just inherently delicious. And like, you know, humans are infinitely creative, but again, there's certain ways of doing things that end up being pretty good. So wow. I wanted to ask you about um, the cooking that you did, right? Cause that was kind of like 
quarantine hit. And then there's a lot of people. And I talked to uh, Sad Poppy and a few other TikTokers who like <laughs> kind of started their TikTok around the start of quarantine because they're like, well, I'm just home all the time. What do I do? Um, and you, you came on and you started doing some really awesome uh, cooking. And I, I always like your videos came up and I just like shout out to Otugi which was the, uh, your, your sesame oil kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, but like, yeah, yeah. can you talk a little bit about like your culture and like how you yeah. made those videos and just, yeah, inspiration for yes. cooking, all that kind of stuff. Sounds good, man. I mean, um, yeah, so for the record, I'm not a trained cook. Um, I'm just a home cook that um, I've always dabbled with stuff in the kitchen. Um, whenever I get an opportunity, I try to cook. I'm passionate about cooking. I like to cook. I like yeah. to eat. Um, yeah. So when TikTok... <laughs> So when the pandemic hit, um, you know, like I just had way more time on my hand like everybody else. And um, I used to do these, you know, like uh, impromptu cooking tutorial just on Instagram story, actually. Mm. And um, a good friend of mine who's uh, the general manager at Complex, Mr. Donnie Kwok, he was like, yo, like this shit is wild annoying, man, watching this on your Instagram story. <laughs> Um, make a TikTok. And I was like, I thought it was just all dance videos. And I was like, <laughs> I, you know, I, I guess. So I started dabbling with it. And um, because of the magic of TikTok's initial algorithm, which is how they basically make you puff the magic dragon, right, and it right. kind of makes you chase the magic dragon, uh, it did really well. And um, I think also, like, it kind of exposed me to a part of the world where they weren't used to seeing an Asian face speaking with a tone of voice and uh, having a certain type of accent. And yep. I think that also kind of um, added to the value of the videos um, getting interest from many different people. So, yeah, I mean, it was a culmination of various things. And, um, you know, uh, when work started picking up again, um, I just didn't have as much time to cook because I think, you know, Cooking is actually, is not only a labor of love, but it takes a long time to make yeah, a yeah. proper dish. <laughs> so, um, yeah. you know, you're talking like a couple hours at least. And this doesn't include just like prepping, buying the ingredients, um, having some sort of a roadmap in your head of what you're going to cook in the kitchen. And... If you're trying to like record this this whole fucking process, oh yeah, that that, you know, and editing the video, yo, this is like <laughs> it, it. It only worked because I, we were in the pandemic. You know what I'm saying? Right, like, right. I had like 12 hours to myself that I could do this. So, <laughs> um, yeah, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not as um, uh, I, I don't have as much bandwidth to um, do these cooking tutorials as I did before. But whenever I get a chance, I try to like document what I do in the kitchen and hopefully I can like you know start rolling those out again you know yeah I feel you. I've, I've tried I, for a little while I was recording some but the process of like trying to cook and record and like not cut my freaking finger off yeah and also in the trying middle to of like it. narrate and trying oh, to now. explain the process yeah it takes like a hundred takes and you have yeah. like less than a minute to oh my god I can't you know I can't so do in it in the but. beginning when I used to like when I was like you know making these so here's another thing like i wasn't making these videos just for the sake of video like you know like i was making these things so i could really eat them like mm -hmm, it, was, mm -hmm. it was like my real nourishment this this is your dinner yeah <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> and i live with my partner so she's like waiting like six o'clock <laughs> this shit is not over <laughs> Come on. and in the beginning like because i had to record this shit like she would wait until like 10 o'clock at night and she would get mad like she's just like yo like this shit is getting out of control like either start cooking earlier or don't record this shit make a choice so yeah that's that's just something else that I, I, I wanted to share with y'all yeah no that's that's that slice of life that's that piece of social media that you don't get when you see people like doing live streams you doing other stuff sometimes their partners in the background like can you hurry up already like i'm trying to eat dinner here i got, I got shit exactly. to do you know like Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, so I want to ask you, because like you mentioned your, um, I like the word vernacular and your, your lexicon and like the, the accent that you have is, is very, I think it's very striking. And it like reminds me of some friends that I grew up with because I went, the high school I went to was a very diverse, very integrated high school. 
and like it's certainly not Queens, but as for where I was in Boston, Cambridge, Ringin Latin was my high school, and it was one of the more diverse high schools in the country. Mm. And like I think that having different ways of speaking and being able to adapt to different situations, I think they call it code switching or whatever, like gives you a lot of power to move around in society. And I feel like you're a guy who's like had experience with that, but like because of your vernacular, you've been able to talk to famous rappers, you've been part of music magazines, you've been able to move in spaces that like I would not be able to move in because the way that I speak is too nerdy. And maybe I could could try to code switch and get along with it. But like, man, I can't do it. So so can you talk to me a little bit about like, because you got some catchphrases, right? You got your you got your bong, you got for the culture, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, talk, yeah. talk to me a little bit about that. Like, where that stuff come from? And how's that? How does it make you relate to your culture? And like, what do you yeah, share yeah. with the world? I, I think a lot of it. Um, hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with the type of music I grew up on, yeah. right? And yeah. also, like, because, and so, you know, like Wu Tang, for instance, is like a, a seminal rap group that, yeah. um, you know, obviously everybody knows who they are. And um, they were really at the forefront of um, pushing new slangs and having AKAs and, you know, using particular type of vernacular, using like very like clicky, um, mm -hmm. you know, they, they basically like had their own language almost, right? Yeah, um, you, I mean, you, you listen to 36 Chambers and like the number of things that are mentioned in there, you still hear woven into the fabric of society now, right. you know, 20 plus years later. Exactly, yeah. so yeah, and you know, that was a huge influence on me as a, as a kid not only as an immigrant kid, because English is my third language. And, um, you know, I didn't learn English from my father or my mom's. Like, I, right. I learned English from, like, listening to Mob Deep and Wu-Tang. So, yeah, yeah. And, and also, I grew up in an environment where, like, that wasn't the only case for me. It was for, like, the entire community of kids. Now, right. some kids probably delved into it a little deeper than you know, others like me, I obviously went the full gamut, you know, um, but, you know, like, I don't think it was, I was the only case, you know, like, I think a lot of other kids, they, they learn English from um, what they saw on TV or, um, you know, popular radio at the time. I mean, damn, radio sounds such a washed, you know, outdated media, but, you know, that was something that we yeah. did. It, so, radio, radio used to be the cool thing. Even when MTV right. was around, radio was still more legit, especially like your local radio station, more so than what you were seeing as pop produced <laughs> MTV. And we certainly grew up in a time where like, the Backstreet Boys existed and there was a counterculture of corn and stuff. And yet underground hip hop was there and it was vibrant and beautiful and amazing and not ever given the same kind of respect or spotlight that that other things got. And so yeah, I you know, totally. I I love hearing from people that are like part of hip hop and and carry that culture with them. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh so that's that's actually interesting that you said that too, because you know, hip hop it was like on its way to become this dominant dominant pop culture, I think like you know, I, I I don't know how old you are, but I'm assuming we're around the same age. Like, we, I, we grew up with with Biggie and and you know, Pun and and Puff Daddy. Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, dope. that's watching the people get famous. But I'm like, this isn't this isn't hip hop, really. In some ways, like puffy right. coats and champagne bottles and stuff. Right, right, right. It is so, hip hop, but it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So like, I think um, you know, because of those influences and uh, me being around like this culture and me really like being infatuated with this culture like uh made me understand that you know in order for you to brand um not not for the sake of TikTok or for the sake of social media but just brand yourself even amongst like as as in, as part in, you know as as a as a as a member of society it's good to have like certain terms that you say that are like your catchphrases whether yeah, that's yeah, yeah whether that is a righteous or whether that is like for the culture. Like I was saying these things before TikTok, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, yeah, they're just part um, of who you, the part of the fabric yeah, of who like, you are. They are. The lexicon is the, the thing that de helps define where you're from. And like the way you speak is the thing that lets people know that you're a representative of, of Queens. And I think that's really important in New York too. You especially see that as a big part of hip hop culture is that people use those particular terms to help define where they're from and, and represent themselves because that's really important 100 percent, right? yeah and um you know for the record 
like bong is something that the RZA said, you know, RZA famously still says it to this day. And um, I definitely took that from him. And, you know, he's the avid, he's the teacher. I mean, he, that, that man has taught me, <laughs> you know, like he said in a skit, um, in a Wu Tang Forever album, man. You know, you ain't even got to go to summer school, shorty. Just listen to the Wu Tang double CD. <laughs> like, yeah, man. That 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 you know, he has influenced me a lot. Um, just overall, and um, you know, Righteous is something that this uh, Queens-based rapper producer, Lodge Professor. So I went on this yeah. trip with him to South Korea. Um, I was like his road manager because uh, somebody, so, uh, a DJ crew I know in Seoul called Three Sixty Sounds booked him for a show. And I was with this guy for a week and like his go-to adjectives was righteous. Like he literally <laughs> took a bite of like kalbi, this Korean marinated rib dish. And it was like righteous. And I was yeah, like, yo, yeah. this is like, he's like a walking Timberland boot. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's like <laughs> hip hop in a human form. Like, you know, and me being around him for a week, like that rubbed off on me, you know? And, and yeah. I started saying righteous and that just kind of stuck. So. You know, I draw all these things from um, different sources, but, you know, I always, like, try to give them the credit where it's due. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. but that's, that's beautiful. You, we are, like, the tapestry of our experiences. And, you know, it's one, I feel like it's one thing you start hanging out with a new crew of people, you start using their words, but, like, it's really cool when you've had lots of experiences from lots of different places and you draw all of that into who you are and, like, how you project yourself to the world. And I mean, what you mentioned too is travel experiences, getting to like go places with these rappers and spend time. Um, and that's, that sounds like a really cool part of the, like the journalism work that you were doing. Right. Um, and, and I mean, that's the thing that I think like a lot of Americans miss the aspect of travel because it's people are like, well, I've been to the state next door. And you're like, that's not really travel. Like going to a place where you are in the minority uh, culturally or physically or in whatever aspect helps you shift and understand that there's a whole wide world out there that we don't necessarily control or like get to dictate how it, things it are you. run. So it humbles you. Cause yeah, like, it, for sure. I, yeah. Like I was um, like, you know, I went from Korea to China uh, when I was like six years old and um, like, I didn't speak a lick of Chinese and, you know, for, for, for maybe, you know, I'm sure your viewers all know the difference that Chinese and Korean is a vastly different language. Um, it is also very different culturally, you know what I'm saying? Very like I, I was like six or seven years old and I just got dropped into a classroom of 60 kids. You know, China is a big country with a lot of people. So like each class had like 60 to 65 kids. And then, you know, like I basically had to do public speaking since I was like six. So, <laughs> you know, when you get like, and then three years later, like I'm in Queens and I get dropped into an environment where I don't speak a lick of English, you know? And um, I think, those type of experiences made me understand that, yo, like, I'm nobody, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and it kind of really humbles you at a younger age. And to your point, um, yeah, I think travel is very important. Um, of course, that is, a, that is a, a, in America, unfortunately, it is a privilege that a lot of people have, that they get to travel um, out of leisure or out of just their, uh, you know, Pure, pure, uh, uh, pure curiosity. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's something that even if you can't travel, I think, like you said earlier, um, it's good to be in environments where you don't feel 100% comfortable. Right. Um, right. Of course, don't put yourself in danger by all Yeah, yeah they're not in danger, like, just, you know. Like, like yeah. we said, when you go into the store and there's the, you don't recognize the language on the menu and you, maybe the chefs behind the thing don't look like you, like, that's good. You can gain from that. You can learn from that. And I, it's an important point about travel, too, because there's a lot of Americans who, like, go down to a resort in Mexico and they're like, oh, I've been to Mexico. And you're like, yeah, but have you been to Mexico City? And they're like, no. Yeah. And you're like, going to a resort is not the same as going to a place where you get to experience that crazy confluence of culture. And, and so I, mean, I guess you, you recently took a trip to Mexico City yeah, and we yeah. were talking a little bit about like what an amazing uh, mishmash of cultures from all over Mexico it is as well yeah. as sort of being an international city with the architecture and all this stuff. But like, yeah, what, what are some of your impressions of being down in Mexico City? I mean, um, it was my second time in Mexico City and um, it's, it's a world-class city in, in North America that is highly underrated. You know what I mean? Because of um, all the issues that Mexico as a country is dealing with um, and, uh, and the unfortunate violence that 
it's um it's an ongoing issue in Mexico. I feel like a lot of um the great traits about this uh I mean Mexico is actually an ancient nation, right? Um yeah, yeah. with history of uh, with the Aztecs, the 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 Mixtecs, the Zapotecs, you know, like it's it's a cult, it's a place of ancient history of anything. You know what I mean? And um I think Mexico City is like this amalgamation of so many different things, like all these European influences from, mm -hmm. you know, Germans to uh, Spaniards to French. Um, yeah, like you have like traces of Europe that is very much visible. Um, you have like food of, you know, ancient people that is also visible. But then you also have like a classism and colorism mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. It's like a, you see what I mean? Like, like I, I just, I had like this, um, this short rib taco um, next to, in the street. And I paid like literally less than a, like 50 cent for yeah. like this giant taco with short rib that was cooked on the spot next to this giant fucking 50 store, a 50 story HSBC headquarter of Mexico. You know what I mean? And like, and it was like just like the disparity that you see like you know what i'm saying like i mean i ate at like some of the best restaurants in mexico and spent like i would say like new york manhattan prices and then like i turn around and i grab like two tacos for like 50 cent like yep. literally right next door and, 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 and it was is one better than the other in in some ways no right like those not, tacos not are almost all. as good not as all. anything you ate at the the three hundred dollar a meal place not at all not at all and also it, it just you know the colorism is so like visibly known like you know mm -hmm. like you see the people dining at these three hundred dollar restaurants tend to be white um and then you see the people serving you is like more indigenous people right like darker skin tone and somehow they all coexist. And um, I think for Americans, we are like the neighbor literally right next door. Uh, but we have like the sense of like hubris that, yo, like whatever we have here is like the best shit that we have. Right. It's great, but yeah, yeah it's, you know, it's great, like, but it's, literally it's not like always the best. Four hours plane ride, you get to be in a whole different country, whole, and, and, and you get like a whole different experience. And, um, yeah, man, it was it was fascinating. I highly recommend it. Yeah, no, it's, I've enjoyed you know watching your videos. That little snippets of culture and food and like elements of how you're drawing stuff in is is super fascinating and like inspired me. Like I've always been meaning to get down there, and now I'm going to prioritize it because I've I've seen your experiences. Like I want I want some of that. I want a little slice of that. Yeah, I want my yeah. my version of seeing that stuff. So again, again, this is also coming from an American privilege, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like I was in the trenches, like having you know like. I feel like I have like, um, you know, some really uh, upper class Mexican friends in America um, that would tell tell me like, oh, when you go down there, make sure you take Ubers everywhere. Uh, make sure that you don't eat food off the streets, you know, because they are like in the upper, upper echelon of Mexico. Right. Where they have like moms that got kidnapped five times and shit. You know what I mean? Like and this does exist in that country. But me, as an Asian American person, like, who are these people gonna like ransom, like, against the U.S. government? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what? Like, where are they gonna get the money from? You know what I'm saying? So, well, they're, they're gonna I, no, they're gonna go to TikTok, man. They're gonna be yeah, like, yo, like, TikTok, you want Jakey back? And be like, yo, we got Jakey hostage. Cough up a million dollars. Like, nah, like they're not gonna do that. You know, TikTok's not coughing up a dime for the shit that I do. <laughs> <laughs> but they probably just saw this Asian kid with a bucket hat, like roaming around, looking like a tourist. Like I would just let him rock. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, as well. So I I'm curious. Um, how do you feel about like Mexican Korean hybrid food? Because that's one I've seen that down in LA, and I've had some like you know kind of tacos that speak to that stuff. Yeah, and like, yeah. it's pretty damn good, you know? Yeah, I, I think like I mean the pioneer of that particular genre of food is my big bro, uh, Chef Roy Choi. Yeah, Roy you know? And he, again, like he's somebody that I have a lot of respect for and he shows me a lot of love just on a human level. And um, he, his food is again, like essentially 
essentially Los Angeles, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's condensed <laughs> like, together, right? Because who did you smash like, together in yeah. the same way that Queens is an amalgamation of stuff Los Angeles is too, right? Yeah, that's essentially, he, he's food is like Los Angeles. Like, yo, like you have a huge Korean culture and you obviously have a huge Mexican Chicana culture. Clash that together. What do you get? Like, you know, you get like gochujang braised al pastor yeah. And, and a tortilla with kimchi, <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> and, and it's like the perfect combination because yo, you yeah. get like a piece of fermented, uh, fermented food, on top of protein, on top of tortilla, which you know, if you just use like pure maize, is like the perfect form of carb, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. boom, like <laughs> it, it's 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 perfect. It's like it's it's Los Angeles in a plate, and um, I think. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, I think an interesting thing that happens, too, is, like, we talked a little bit about Mex traditional Mexican food and them using, like, grasshoppers and beans and corns, and, uh, things that had a, a relatively low carbon footprint and lots and lots of fiber. Right. But as, if you've looked at the evolution of Mexican food, and particularly popular Guadalajara Mexican food that has come to America, it's very meat-centric, very meat-based. And that is what's perpetuated around a lot of California, too. Right. But adding... Combining it there with the Korean food kind of brings back some of the stuff like the fermented kimchi brings back some of those traditional foods that actually helps like enhance the nutritional profile of it. So like, <laughs> again, by like smashing cultures together, you can like take the best parts of those cultures and like kind of build them together in a way that like might even be more nutritionally beneficial than it was before. You know what? That's actually a fascinating point because, you know, like the whole concept of like eating pork in Mexico didn't exist until the Spaniards came by, right? And right. also, like, the whole concept of, like, you know, having, like, the, the, the rotisserie. Not, not the yeah, rotisserie. That's, that's from like, Lebanon. The El Pastor yeah. thing is from Lebanon. Yeah, it's, it's from Lebanon. So, like, you get that type of cultural influence. So when people say, like, yo, this is traditional Mexican food, it's like traditions evolve. Traditions yeah. happen yeah. as new things come, come forth. Like, uh, a thousand years later, like, Hawaiian musubi is going to be a traditional food using spam you know what i mean like i i don't think and i don't think there's like anything wrong with that you know what i mean i, I think no. it's all fair and fair game and i think it's all beautiful you know what i'm saying so um yeah I, I but um yeah man like you said like fermented food i actually want to ask you this man like yeah, because, yeah. like what are your thoughts on like fermented food because as somebody who is korean um, I grew up eating fermented food all my life, and it wasn't until I came to America I realized, like, fermented food is not something that everybody eats. No. No, it, it, American culture definitely, like, I think in the traditional food cultures of Europe and with a lot of the initial immigration that came to America, that fermentation was more important, especially with as a preservation method, right? You know, like doing salt curing, making pickles, you know, any form of fermenting dairy and making cheese and stuff is things that have, like have maintained to some degree. And they're in popular culture, but like active live fermentations with like real bacteria and yeasts and stuff like that have, have gone away because of there was this like whitewashing of American food culture that happened with World War II and everything became canned and microwavable and freezable and all this other stuff. And like when you preserve food in that method, it kills it. So we stopped eating food that was still alive. We started eating things that had these long shelf lives and mm -hmm. we all pretended we like lived in a bunker 24 seven, which is like, you can live in a bunker, but like, are you really living with no sunshine and no live food, right. Right. you know? And like, I mean, the interesting thing is that fermented food is actually something you could subsist with in a bunker and give yourself some of that life, give yourself some of that vitamin D, some of those other things that like you might be missing if you're living underground. So I think within American food culture, there's this like emerging movement of people wanting to go back to fermentation. Right. But of course, it's being <sighs> kind of misused or kind of trendy, kind of like it's very fashionable to eat fermented food. And you're like, well, it's not fashionable in Korea to eat kimchi. It's just life. It's just what you do. And so like to have people be like, oh, you should take all these like supplements and these other things. Like, no, man, just like go back to eating traditional foods that were prepared in traditional ways with traditional ingredients and and let the microbes do the work for you because like in its essence what fermentation is is taking one carb form of carbon and turning it into another <laughs> form and that transformation is what i call a, a trophic transformation so like you've heard of in ecology you have like 
the the little fish eats the the plankton the bigger fish eats it and then like you know you kind of go up in trophic levels but every time you go up you lose efficiency and Mm -hmm. you lose a lot of efficiency and so eating tuna and eating beef is incredibly wasteful you know we do a lot better just eating algae and and basic plant matter but that's not as good to eat so what you get out of fermentation is instead of having this big step up every time and losing efficiency that it's almost like drawing a diagonal line so like the microbes are helping you do a better transformation of your food to make it more energy efficient and more carbon efficient in a more delicious way and for me it's not the sustainability aspect it's just the deliciousness right you know like turning soybeans into miso makes it infinitely more nutritious and more sustainable but like, man, miso is really good. You know, mm-hmm. I don't care if it's better for me or not. I just want to eat the thing that tastes good. So like, that's what I love about fermentation is you're distilling down, you're using microbes to transform food into something that's like that much more delicious. And I love right. that about it. So. Right. And, but, but also is like, I mean, you just said that miso is delicious for you. Um, but obviously that's not the case for a lot of people, right? Because well, they just don't know about it yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's my and, argument. And I but... think like in order for the palate to develop, you know, it, it usually has to start at a very young age. And um, I was talking with a friend about this. And, um, you know, so like we went out to eat and, you know, he's, he's a black dude. And he was telling me like, yo, like I'm always down to try new food. But I also, uh, but I understand like this is something that not applicable to everybody because like, you know, where he comes from, like, I mean, this guy, you know, he, he has like, he, he had like a very different uh, upbringing than I did. Right. And, um, you know, he he was like, yo, like, like I didn't grow up eating apples. I had like applesauce and shit, you know what I'm saying? Like, so (laughs) like it, it took a while for me to even understand like avocados, you know what I'm saying? Like understand like. A, a nutritional value of like real food, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Of, of a whole of, like, food versus something that's been heavily processed. Right, right, exactly. So yeah, like, so, you know, he was like breaking this shit down for me and it kind of really made me realize like, damn, like um, I had a privilege of eating like real fruits and real food uh, ever since I was a kid. Um, mm-hmm. But that's not really the case for a lot of people. And um, I just think like that shit is almost like criminal what like fucking you know what we feed kids you know what i'm saying because like when i first came to america i went to public school yeah cafeteria food in public schools i was like looking back i'm like holy shit these motherfuckers really fed me hot pockets (laughs) and like chocolate milk you know what i'm saying like like for kids you know what i mean like i'm talking like nine-year-old kids like you know they fucking fed us like canned uh what is it like pineapple as yeah, canned food. pineapple, canned green beans, yeah. like, you know, really terrible pizza with canned and, and sauce and milk. sugary like, cheese. Like, literally yeah. chocolate milk every day. And um, not even water. Like, it wasn't even part of the diet. Like, you know what I'm saying? So that, that really just kind of made me think, man. And, um, I mean, you said that um, these things taste good. But when you are, like, so wired to drink chocolate milk and Hot Pocket, right, right. you know, like, when – and you – you're trying to like introduce them to a new flavor dynamic that is so foreign, you know, they're going to be a lot of resistance. And I, and I'm curious to know, like, what are your thoughts about like, okay, how can we break down that resistance? How can we break down that barrier? Like, does this start from schooling? Like, do we really try to like change the type of food that gets provided in the, in the public school sector to kids of all socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, you know, backgrounds, you know what I mean? Or like, you know, like, what do we do? Or do we like make chips that (laughs) is like super healthy, but then we brand it with like, you know, have rappers like have, you know, have like provocative (laughs) promiscuous woman dancing on top of these chips and have or kombucha on top of themselves to hypersexualize it so we could do better sales of it, you know what I mean? I think about so like a lot. I think that's I think that's brilliant, right? You make a lentil chip, but you make it sexy. Make rappers, you know, promote the thing that's like this has you don't you don't advertise it. This has fiber. This has vitamin D. Just like this is the bling chips, you know, like yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. No, um, I mean, I think like to your point, it's it's that's kind of what we have to do. There's an element of like to get people to accept science, to get people to accept nutrition. You don't tell them that it's good for them, and you don't tell them the reasons why you're promoting it. You just start doing it. 
and there's there was a um i think the like the mushroom council or some some organization that promotes people eating mushrooms was basically put out a challenge to chefs to say hey make a burger that's 50 percent mushroom and that wow. like the studies that i've seen when people did that stuff is they they did it with school kids where they like just i mean they did really standard like cafeteria of like overcooked puck of a burger versus a, a burger that had like 50 percent mushroom matter in it and time after time the kids chose the mushroom burger mm. which is in theory you're like wow this is half the amount of beef it's got mushrooms so there's there's dietary fiber there's vitamins there's things that aren't in beef it's more sustainable and like you don't have to tell the kids that it's 50 percent mushroom you can just be like here's a burger the kids aren't going to care they're gonna be like i want a burger done easy but now this burger is suddenly better for them and i'd, I'd say that with a lot of foods you can do a similar thing that like instead of just putting processed ingredients in you could stir in a spoonful of miso to that like mm -hmm. soup you made or like i make cream sauce all the time and my secret ingredient is throwing a spoonful of miso because it like makes it so much more savory and like more unctuous and you don't even taste it necessarily when it's in the end product and so that's right. i think one of the best things you can do is like you kind of said is like figure out a way to make something and it's okay to process food as long as we leave more of the ingredients in there that are worthwhile eating or maybe we right. even add some stuff back you know we like take the brand from the rice and put that in the chip, put that in the seasoning, use technology to help us process it, to make it more fun to eat. And then, yeah, like do branding um, and do, I mean, there's education. I don't know if you've seen waffles and mochi that's on Netflix. And um, that's like Michelle Obama's like, you know, I, I've watched it. It's like, it's a kid's show, but like I've enjoyed what? watching it. Yeah, there's a, there's a mushroom episode with my friend Eugenia. That's, that's a lot of fun. You should definitely watch that one. Check that out. Um, the mochi already waffles and mochi. Name. Yeah, it's, it's, it's dope. And if you have like, if you've got a, you know, a niece or a whatever, just send it to them to like, watch this. This is, this is the way to go. Right. Um, but that's, I think that's kind of what we have to do is like, as our, if we want the world to be a better place, we have to like envision the kind of change we want to see and mm -hmm. like try to put that stuff out there. So like, I'm always telling people on TikTok, it's like, if you want to be healthier, like just literally cut your meat consumption by half and like fill it with mushrooms. Um, you'd be amazed. Like I, I dropped a bunch of weight over quarantine by basically just doing that. And I was like, wow, this, I feel way better. And I'm like, I'm not saying that like what works for me will work for others, but like right. it'd be a really quick way to like reduce our carbon footprint and make the world a healthier place if we just ate more mushrooms, you know, right. not that we have to yeah. stop eating meat. Like I, vegans and vegetarians are fine, but like a lot of people like eating meat and I'm not trying to take that away from them. I'm just trying to say right. eat more mushrooms, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, shit. I, is there like a lobby group that advocates for mushrooms? Like, yo, like you need to join that shit where you need to be yeah. a spokesperson of it. You know what I mean? At least they need to pay you for all the service that you're doing, bro. Like, you're trying Thank to you, start baby. the Got Milk movement, but with mushrooms. <laughs> got, got mushrooms. Yeah, oh yeah yeah well i mean it's you know it's a long road ahead but but i'm doing what i can so nah, this is beautiful man I, I think this is like a lifelong mission that you discovered um and i'm assuming that this really got more accentuated and um uh, proliferated during the quarantine right so yeah definitely um, yeah i mean you know shit like i know a lot of people suffered but i feel like you know a lot of people also figured out um their new passion and their new uh you know new approach niche, to, right yeah, that, niche, what, what they could do spot. yeah you know. it really kind of make them hyper focused during the quarantine and i think you're an example i'm an example um yeah like i, I think this is this is beautiful but um uh, to to that point though like about like meat consumption yeah like i, I love meat man you know i love meat pause um i love it i love fish i love protein um, I've done like, you know, I guess like moments where I did, didn't eat meat for about a month and I lost weight and I felt better. But mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's essentially, the, uh, it's, it's lack of discipline, it's lack of like, um, I, I guess it's over justification that the taste, uh, you know, right. or uh, the, the scent of burning meat is something that I feel like as a human being primal, primal our, and central yeah, yeah. Like we owe it to our ancestors <laughs> like <laughs> you know but i do think that um the americanized diet or and by america i don't just mean the united states i mean like latin america places World, worldwide you know, yeah, yeah argentina brazil it's is over consumption of meat you know what i mean I, I i don't think we really need to eat that much meat you know what i'm saying like i think a lot of people associate Korean food with Korean barbecue, but the concept of Korean barbecue didn't really proliferate until 
you know, Koreans started having immigration into the United States, you know, like mm -hmm. eating kalbi, which is uh, short ribs um, over open charcoal grill that always existed in Korean culture. Um, but it wasn't something that was meant to be done on a daily basis. It was really something that was um, done for the sake of like when there is a special moment, you know, like, and I think like this type of culture is prevalent in all forms of like, in, in all human societies. Like you go to the Middle East, parts of the Middle East, and um, you go to that region, oh, like somebody's getting married. All right, shit, we got to kill a goat. You know, like yeah, yeah. similar in like Asia, like we're in Korea, like, oh, like, yo, it's like a special day. Yo, we killing a chicken or like, you know, like, yo, our ancestors needs to be celebrated. I, right, you know, let's kill that old cow that, um, you know, was done with his mileage. It can't like mow the land anymore. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. I just don't think that like, kind of like that avocado conversation we had earlier is like the shelf life system of having all this, you know, surplus of food right. for our consumption, waiting to be consumed, like, it's just not sustainable, man. Yeah, we're, we, we're all suffering health-wise because we're, you know, it's like we're celebrating every day. And it's, you know, even, even in Korea, if you were to have that, uh, that celebration, you're probably still eating your, your meat with, like, a bite of lettuce, some banchan, some kimchi. Like, right. there's so much diversity that goes into it. And, like, you see this around the world as like prosperity increases, meat consumption increases because people want to celebrate. People want to eat those delicious things. Right. But it's like, it's important to kind of bring that balance back. And that's like, gets back to what we were talking about, like ecosystems and competition and like how humans interact with nature is like, everything needs to come back to some sort of like central balance because like there's going to, I think with within our lifetimes, there's a tipping point that's happening with the environment and the climate and you know social factors that are going to like make it so that we can't eat the way we eat and like i don't want to go to the point of eating soylent green packed you know frozen freeze-dried algae kind of bullshit no i want to eat real food but like we gotta we gotta farm it we gotta advocate for it we gotta like have people like you that can like help us explore the cultures and see all the different aspects of stuff that help us like realize the the promise that food has realize the promise that like sharing our cultures together can help us like find new ways forward and innovate new foods like Roy did, you know, in, in LA and like right. f find these confluences that just like allow us to move forward together. I think in an yeah, in interesting yeah, yeah. way. I mean, so you, what you're doing is beautiful, man. Like, I, I mean, I don't want to like circle jerk each other. Pause, <laughs> like, I mean, like shit, like you're advocating for, um, you're advocating for a genre of food that is highly untapped. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and, yeah, eat more mushrooms, man. Yeah, and all, but it's like, there's like probably a million different types of mushrooms that are still yet to be discovered. And yeah, like. These, these are all the edible. These are all poisonous, but these are all edible. Right, right. I mean, all the edible ones that are like part, like, yeah, like, you know, my, my folks own and operate an acupuncture clinic slash like herbal medicine shop. And, um, you know, I grew up around like all these, uh, uh, different type of like ingredients that go into mm. these herbal medicine and um you know i'm talking like elk horns to you know dried dead bug skin mm -hmm. so you like, probably get like reishi mushrooms and cordyceps and there's all sorts of like great medicinal mushrooms that they use in those blends. all types of shit like that and then they kind of just put it in a pouch and then they steam it and then they extract like this brown juice um that tastes like shit but, you <laughs> yeah. know it's good for your body it, it, it brings your vitality and all types of, um, you know, other nutritional values. So I grew up around that environment. So like, you know, there's so much in nature that it provides for us that uh, during my recent trip to Mexico City, I met this chef named Lalo. He's one of the uh, Mexico's most celebrated chefs. He has a restaurant called Maximo, which uh, Bourdain, rest in peace to his mm. son. Um, in the Mexico City episode, um, he features Lalo and um, I was like just spending some time with him and he just goes, yo, like there isn't much technique to what I do, man. It's all in the ingredients and nature gives us, nature gives us everything. And, you know, this is coming from somebody who was a day laborer in Mexico. I mean, in the United States and then he got kicked out of the U S twice 
and now he's permanently in Mexico. Um, and he has seen many things, you know what I mean? This guy has been in prison. He was, you know, he taught himself how to cook by working up the ladder in the professional kitchen. And um, he emphasizes the importance of ingredients. And he emphasizes that, like, we don't really need to go out of our way to look for shit. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? We don't need to invent new things. You know, there's so much already in nature. And um, I think what you're doing with, you know, this advocacy or this, you know, you're basically evangelizing mushrooms, man. And um, it's beautiful. You the mushroom Jesus, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where you're just like... <laughs> I'll take that. So there's an interesting thing in what you said about that chef. And I remember that Bourdain episode because that was one of the ones that first convinced me is like put Mexico City on the map for me. And I was like, man, I should, I should go check it out. Right. Uh, it, talking about the concept of locality, true, right? And like letting ingredients shine. And that's something you hear again and again from really good chefs. And I hear it all the time here in Napa with the winemakers who are like, hey, I don't even do that much to the grapes. I just let the what's called terroir, the, uh, the essence of the land, the essence of the place shine through in the food or in the, in the wine that you're making. And you're trying to take the ingredients and essentially you're taking the best ingredients possible. And this is like the crux of all Italian food too, is to take the best ingredients possible and then just don't mess it up in the kitchen and right. put it on the plate and let those things express themselves because they're seasonal, because they're local, because they are, you know, indicative of the land that you're in and eating that stuff just makes you feel so much better and so much more connected. And that like, again, spins us back to like stuff like mushrooms, which are ephemeral. They don't come up all year long. So like there are certain mushrooms that people always ask me like, what's your favorite? And I'm like, I don't know. I can't pick one. Cause I just like whatever's in season. You know, it's like, I pick the ones that I am eating right now. And those are my favorites. Cause that's what's on my plate. So yeah, that's, that's beautiful, man. That shit. I, I guess I need to like start a separate calendar of all the, fruits and seasons so i could keep track <laughs> there you go there you go well you got i mean you got the nyc markets you got all sorts of cool stuff in queens so that's, yeah, that's we, fun we to see. do but, we do definitely definitely man but yeah. um yeah man i mean um shit like we we've been talking for like an hour and two yeah I, I should i should let you go this is this has been fun i feel like we could go on for another hour and, and someday yeah. i gotta come to queens and we gotta like go check out some small joints and like grab beer together or drink some soju yeah, or something man. like I mean, that you know like I, I, I guess I got to, like, pull up to Napa, man, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, for sure. If you want to, I can hook you up with a winery tour, you know? Yeah, beautiful. Um, I got to tell my lady, um, she, she's, a, she's a big wine person. Uh, I'm not as much of a, an alcoholic, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, right, that's all good. I'll get you, I'll get you thinking about, your you know, the palate, the nose, the different aspects of wine. It's not just about the drinking. It's about the experience. So. For sure, 1,000%. Actually, so I'll put that down, you know, into the, one of the next visits. But, uh, yo, appreciate your time, man. Mushroom yeah, sure. Jesus. <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Right, this, has been, this has been great. Have a good one. Peace. Bye.